All right, let's talk some pucks. Kevin Derso's with us here. Now, I'm not going to ask Derso on the poll question. Why? Because he knows the three guys. Well, what if he doesn't? But then he's fired. I agree. Well, let's see if we can fire him on the air. I mean, if he's covering the Flyers and he doesn't know who the three MVP, the top three candidates for the award are, then I don't want him talking to hockey anymore. Right. I think he knows who Panarin, Dreisaitl, and McKinnon are, but you never know. Let's see. Let's see if we can fire the man on the air if he doesn't know who they Ooh, are. An on air firing. And Kevin Durso on the boardwalk on the hotline. Kevin, what's up, buddy? What's up, guys? How you doing? Now, you know the three MVP award finalists in the NHL, I presume? I'm going to disappoint Broads here. I do know them, so you're not getting an on-air fire. There you go. I thought you were going to say he was going to disappoint you. <laughs> you know what I mean? I thought that's where he was going there. Yeah. I got a little nervous. I said, now, let me ask you, do you think that those three guys are the most deserving? And I say this because, <laughs> I say this because, you got Panarin on a team that would not have made the playoffs. Um, the Edmonton guy, I can't even, I don't even know who that is. Dry Seidel. Dry Seidel. His team is about 500. Now, McKinnon, I get, they're, they're good. They're, they're, they're a cup, you know, worthy team. Yeah, I, I think that the interchangeable one out of the three would probably be Panarin. If, if everything would have finished up the way it normally does and you didn't have this structure, then I think you probably would have seen David Pasternak in there instead of Panarin. Because Boston was so successful and Pasternak was so far above even, you know, even guys like Marshan and Bergeron who are go-to guys for that team and have been for years. Pasternak is becoming a league superstar. So I think he would have been in there. No question about it. But the other two, I think, you know, McKinnon is a, is a superstar player in his own right. And I mean, you know, again, it's, it's a casual hockey fan kind of thing. I don't know that many people know too much about him and they probably should because McKinnon should be one of these guys who is, put out there as one of the faces of the league. He actually comes from the same hometown as Sidney Crosby and Cole Harbor uh, in Nova Scotia. So that he's local to the same area that Sidney Crosby is and in Canada. Everybody would know who he is, but in the U S it's a bit of a different story. So um, he's deserving. And dry is a guy who has just been lighting it up all year long to put up that kind of point total in with still 11 games to go in your season is outstanding. And there were, there were points in the year where he had to do this without, Connor McDavid in the sense where they wouldn't play him on the same line. He didn't have that same kind of support and he really never missed a beat. So he really helped carry that team to where they are. And you know what? The the thing about Edmonton too, is that yes, they may not look like they're lighting it up in the standings, but they kind of like the flyers came from a spot where they were out of the playoffs completely and looked like they were a team in disarray a year ago. And now they're in this playoff picture. They legitimately were going to be in the playoffs and, he certainly, I would say he's probably the guy who's going to take the award this year, if, if I had to guess. All right, let's uh, take a look closer here. Carter Hart, you have a piece up right now at 97.3 ESPN, kind of expressing a little bit of a concern, but it seemed that Elaine Vigneault uh, calmed everybody down today. Are you buying in? I'm buying in for now, and I say that because, you know, one of the things I put in that piece is, is that, you know, the timing of this right now, Leaves, leaves you some time to not be overly concerned about it. I think the concern level comes from the lack of knowledge that we have on injuries. I mean, realistically, that game next week against Pittsburgh really doesn't carry, it carries no weight in terms of anything with standings or seating or anything like that. So it, it really doesn't make a big difference to me whether or not he plays in that game or not. And as long as he's pulling himself off the ice as a precaution and misses maybe a few days' time like we're hoping here – then it's not that big of a concern. The concern is that you be, it's the way that the information is given around the league in these in these final phases, in phase three and phase four. The, the idea that you are only going to be able to know if a player is unable to participate and get no real information. The fact that Elaine Vigneault even said it's something that doesn't concern him, quite frankly, is a little tapping into a little bit of information that you, we probably didn't think we were going to have because even that's probably stretching it a little bit and towing the line a little bit. The thing that I kind of found interesting is, is that and I cited a few different examples in the piece, one of them being Jake Voracek from late last week where he misses a day. And basically, while saying that player privacy is something that's important, said, if you guys really want to know, go ahead and ask and I'll tell you. And sure enough, the question was asked and he gave the full story that his test was delayed and then came back inconclusive. He had to take another test and it was negative and he was allowed to play on Sunday. But You've had players from around the league who have updated their own status. Tuka Rask of Boston basically told reporters just yesterday he's dealing with a small, a small fracture in one of his fingers in his catching hand, and that's why he's been 
in and out of practices. You had Connor, uh, you had um, Austin Matthews for Toronto, and you had uh, Caleb Jones for Edmonton, who confirmed their positive COVID test after they were able to return. And that's, again, the players who are giving out the information. So there's almost a bit of a double standard in the sense that the teams aren't allowed to disclose this information, but if the player wants to, he's technically allowed to if he gets in front of the media. So that's kind of where we are with this. And obviously to this point, the fact that we haven't heard anything from Carter Hart is what will keep the concern levels rising. If he's not available to even so much as talk, then the speculation is going to come as a result of that. Yeah, because he was actually supposed to speak yesterday after practice, and then he did not even go to the media availability at all. So I'm just more concerned with the back spasm if it happens down the road again. Not so much this one being the issue, but you know how they move around in the blue paint. It's possible that this can maybe retweak or something of that nature. But how many round-robin games, and you can even include the exhibition game as well, do you think that Carter Hart should play to make sure that he is ready? you got to try and balance health with making sure that they're at the level to compete. Yeah, and we already know that they're going to split these four games that they have, the one exhibition and the three-round robins between Carter Hart and Brian Elliott in some combination. I think a healthy way of doing it would be giving each one of them two games. I think two for each would be a way for me to feel comfortable with either one going in net when needed. It's it's obvious that this is not going to be the traditional playoff that – everybody is used to this is not going to be something where usually a team usually by this point has a guy that they roll with throughout the duration of the playoffs unless a guy is injured at some point and I don't think you're going to see it that way at all I think what you're going to see is teams that are more willing to treat things kind of like a regular season where you may go with a a different guy and give your primary goaltender a spell um, just to get some extra rest to be healthy to make sure he doesn't do anything that would lead to significant injury. And so even in a playoff series, even in a seven game playoff series, you might find yourself in a comfort level where you feel like if Carter Hart gets you two wins in a row and you have a series lead, maybe you do throw it to Brian Elliott the next game just to give Carter Hart a break and get Brian Elliott some playing time. This is going to be where we really start to see the tandems come into play. I think. All right, Kevin Durso covers the Flyers for 97.3 ESPN.com at Kevin underscore Durso. Let's uh, get some news here on uh, Oscar Lindblom, who, what an amazing story, by the way. Signed a three-year contract extension today. Uh, he'll get uh, an annual value of $3 million, so $9 million over the three years for him. 11 goals, 18 points, 30 games in the NHL. That's an MVP candidate. I'm just kidding. Um, and uh, I thought the interesting part here was Chuck Fletcher didn't put to rest that Lindblom could possibly make the trip to Toronto and then possibly play. Yeah, that was definitely the interesting part. I'll start by just talking about the contract for a second, and I'm right there with you. It's a remarkable story. And not only is it a remarkable story, it's great news for him that this has been – it's a tough six, seven months from finding out, that, finding out the diagnosis to going through the cancer treatments to finishing them off at the beginning of this month and he gets rewarded in a contract year where he wasn't able to really complete the performance he had started in the first three months of the season, first two, three months of the season, and was definitely on track to give you career numbers, have a real breakout year that showed he was a valuable player on this team. And he actually, by not being on the ice and going through this battle, inspired the rest of the team and had an off-ice contribution that was so big that it, it didn't do anything to affect his future with this team so that's why the contract is so deserved because not only is he a good player on the ice but his off ice presence is incredible as well and then you have what Chuck Fletcher said about the possibility of him being able to play now I don't know how likely this really is it feels like for months we've been downplaying the possibility that he could even join the team that he would even be allowed to go and I don't know that we'll ever necessarily see him get on the ice during the thing but I guess I got to go with what Chuck Fletcher says. Don't say anything is impossible with Oscar Lindblom. I think he's already proven that he can defy the odds of having to go through this battle. He did it very quickly. He did it successfully. He's where he needs to be to be able to start training again. And if he can get comfortable really quickly, if they can get him on the ice with the team and include him in this roster as one of the players who is available, if he's available and he's one of your best players and he's performing the way that you want to see, then there's no reason to hold him off if he is in good health and 
can, and it can be done safely. I don't know that we'll see it. I do think that it does speed up his timeline for returning in general, though. I know what, recently when I talked to you guys about him finishing the treatments, I had said it wouldn't surprise me that he was back on the ice within the next two seasons. I think now the sights are very clearly set on him being available uh, by by next season for sure. I don't see how if he's able to if they're talking about this and saying don't rule out the possibility in this short amount of time that they're going to be traveling to Toronto, work, uh, working out of a hub city, trying to complete the playoffs, and he might be available during this. If that's a, if that's even a remote possibility, then I definitely think it's a possibility that he's ready to play if the NHL can stay on track and start next season in December. He's definitely going to probably play next season if that's the case. Real quick, because we're coming up to a break here, do you think it's the year that Kutsi finally wins the Selkie? I'm a little nervous with Bergeron, but I think because he won it, what, four times already, maybe they pass it on to somebody else who has at least been recognized in the past without winning the hardware. You know, it, it's going to be tough. It, you named the other finalist who I think gives him the toughest competition. I think it's between him and Bergeron, and I do think that this could be his year. You know, not only do a lot of his teammates talk so highly of him, Ian LaPerriere, an assistant coach for the Flyers, actually used words that he didn't really want to use when he talked about and said he's pretty much a perfect player. And there's, there's players around the league who note that he is – such a good player. He's always in position defensively, and that's what makes him so tough to play against. And then you look at the offensive production that he's had over the last few years. He's definitely given you what you need to be that offensive producing forward, but also so responsible on the defensive end. I think this could very well be his year. I certainly hope it is because he deserves the recognition for being this type of player year in and year out, and I, I would like to see it happen. Uh, for more on the Flyers, Day 10, Phase 3 practice update, go to 97.3ESPN.com, at Kevin underscore Durso. Follow him as the Flyers open up their uh, exhibition schedule on Tuesday against the Penguins. You'll hear that game right here on 97.3 ESPN. They open up the round-robin portion of their schedule. It's a three-game round-robin on Sunday, August 2nd. Flyers and the Bruins will have that game for you live on 97.3 ESPN. They play the Caps on Thursday, August 6th, and the Tampa Bay Lightning on Saturday, August the 8th. And for more Flyers, follow Kevin underscore Durso. All right, Kevin, take care, pal. Thanks, guys. You too. And Kevin Durso, like all guests, appeared to be the Boardwalk Honda Hotline. We'll have plenty more from Kevin during the Flyers playoffs and... During the new game night show with Josh Henning, he will be a big part of that leading into any Flyers games.